Today we are going to be talking about Christianity in the Roman Empire. Specifically, we're going to be looking at it more from how the Romans saw the Christians and in order to help explain like kind of why the Romans had the reaction they did. We are going to look at the background, uh, Jewish background, Jesus, that type of stuff, because you have to have that to understand the other. But then when we get into early Christianity, instead of just kind of talking about Christian doctrine, what I want to look at is, is, is how it developed within the Roman Empire and how the Romans perceived them. Um, because I think that's often overlooked and it helps explain a whole lot about why they didn't get along because normally in a polytheistic religion, uh, it's the more the merrier, right? We've seen that with, with the Mesopotamians and the kind of potential part of every God, the Egyptians, uh, the Persians. Anyway, it's kind of like, Hey, we like, you know, the, any God, bring them on in. So in this case, you have the Romans who are polytheistic and they reject Christianity. Well, there's several reasons for that. So we're going to take a look at that. Uh, and, and this is a kind of a fun subject for me. I enjoy talking about this one just because it's, it's interesting how the Romans like, uh, interpreted and, and, uh, interacted with the Christians throughout this period. And then how the Christians responded to that as, as well. So in order to understand all of that, we have to take a look again as a, a refresher, because we've looked at this some already, the Jewish background. Because obviously Christianity grows out of uh, uh, Judaism and uh, their practices and beliefs and expands from there. So you do have to understand kind of what's going on with that. Uh, we, we know, of course, uh, I guess that you could put it, if you go way far back, you could look at it as, as the kingdom um, of um, uh, Israel and Judah when they split. Uh, but then after that, right, so you have, you have the kingdom of Israel and then later the kingdom of Judah as well in that division, but this is a small independent period. And we, and we looked at that. They were only independent because of the, that universal collapse around the 1200 BC period, like more, more closely 1177, but 1200 BC is easier to remember. So around 1200 BC, you had all the major societies collapse, uh, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, um, and, uh, with those collapses, there was others too. Um, it gave a vacuum of power for the Phoenicians and the Hebrews to create their own independent kingdoms that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to have. And not surprisingly, when, uh, societies began to recover, the Assyrians took over the kingdom of Israel with the 10 lost tribes and the Bab Neo-Babylonians took over the kingdom of Judah, uh, after that, um, they then are now, so what's left is the kingdom of Israel kind of gets dispersed and ceases to exist in many ways. The, 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 uh, people of the kingdom of Judah in uh, at least the, uh, nobility, the boys end up in Babylon, um, with Nebuchadnezzar and, uh, working for Babylon. Babylon falls to the Persians, right? And the Persians free everyone from that system, but they don't free them in terms of, uh, like you're free to go, whatever, do whatever you want. We have, we don't care is <laughs> you're free to do whatever you want. However, you are now a, a tributary state. So, um, after their very brief, I guess we should put captivity, right? Cause that's what I was talking about there is, uh, yes, there is captivity where they really have, have no freedom. And then you move to a tributary state and they kind of stay that way from then on out. So the Persians first, but here's the thing, uh, they loved Cyrus. So here we could put loved Cyrus. Cyrus. They love Cyrus so much. He gets put into the Bible later about how fantastic he was and that God like, you know, used him to help the, the Jewish people. So there was a tributary ruler done right with the propaganda and the edict of Cyrus, which got, they, they, they were <laughs> glad and happy and loved him that not so much for all the other tributary states after uh, Persia. But with Cyrus, they were happy um, because they weren't in captivity anymore and he did allow them to return and rebuild their temple and all of that. So then you have their tributary states under the Greeks and then finally what we're going to look at with the Romans. And so you have within these this Hellenistic culture and period which they uh, don't really like. Okay, so yay for the Persians, eh for 
for everyone else in the tributary state. And there really was, because of uh, uh, these two periods, we'll put it under the Romans, but it's for both the Greeks and the Romans, um, there was this internal struggle, struggle with Hellenistic culture um, that the, the, the Jewish population uh, kind of uh, worked with. Um, they didn't like the Hellenistic culture of the Greeks and then the Romans uh, either. Uh, so they were very unhappy under the Greeks first, um, but it, it continued with the Romans. And so you had this um, struggle within the culture of rejecting that type of culture. Um, there, there obviously was a general dislike for being controlled as well. I mean, I think that's everyone, although you, again, <laughs> um, you could argue that they seem to be all right with Cyrus controlling them. But, but in general, you see through the whole period of the Greek control and Roman control, um, they, they don't like being a tributary state. It does go back to this idea, though, that the, the uh, Hellenistic culture was corruptive of their beliefs, their religious beliefs. And so they did try to distance themselves. Uh, we'll see. What's, what's interesting with this is that... Um, and right, well, we'll put this with the Romans here too, is as much as they had a, a desire to overthrow the Romans, the Romans were um, relatively what, accepting of, of them, um, tolerant Roman, let's say Roman position on uh, Jewish people. Yeah, we'll go with that. So Romans liked to, um, normally, right? Romans liked to assimilate. It's like the Borg. Resistance is futile. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they like to assimilate, uh, peoples into their culture. They almost expected it. Uh, that, that if you, because the, the idea was, oh, Roman culture and society is uh, so great and awesome, you want to be like us, who doesn't want to be like us. They were very full of themselves. And, uh, the, and, and they had some reason to be. They had conquered and expanded into quite a, a ways. Nonetheless, um, they didn't expect that from the Jewish population because uh, Romans respected antiquity. It was one of the things um, that they always held on to, um, and we'll say a tradition is that if you were, uh, an older culture, they did have respect for that. Um, and, and the Jewish people, you know, if you look through the Hebrew history, all the way, go back all the way to Mesopotamia. So they had antiquity and history and tradition. And as much as the Romans did not, the, the feeling of dislike was, was, was mutual. The Romans did not like them like a uh, Jewish population because mostly the fact that they uh, uh, caused trouble and uh, constantly caused problems that they had to deal with and, and put down. And so that, that was a big thing. But here's the interesting thing is that as much as Rome normally required people to assimilate and follow their cultural traditions and practices um, with uh, um, with the Roman structure, with the Jewish people, they did allow them um, additional freedoms with laws. Okay, so how the structure of this worked is, um, and I, let's see, I moved over too much here, so let's, whoosh, we'll go over here, and we'll one the structure. Uh, so you had what was called a provincial governor. This was in Rome. When they conquered um, an area, um, you'd always put a provincial governor. And the provincial governor's job was, um, their, their main responsibility was uh, to watch for, and this is their language, bad men, right? Those that were going to cause trouble and stop it. So you were to make sure um, that, that uh, you, if you were a provincial governor, um, that you uh, made sure that there weren't people that were like encouraging rebellion or revolt. You also were supposed to make sure taxes were paid. And in general, the idea of 
keeping the peace, making sure that they pay the taxes, there's no revolts, and Rome is happy. Provincial governor could be good, it could be bad, it just depended. They also uh, were there to make sure that they were um, responsible for Roman law. Right, so if you committed a crime, things like that. Now, there, the uh, Judea had a provincial governor. That's going to be Pontius Pilate at the time of, of Jesus. But here's the thing that's interesting. As much as they had the provincial governor, and yes, they had to pay taxes, and yes, they, they, they were there to keep the peace. Um, when it comes to Roman law, what they did for the Jewish population is that they did something that they didn't allow in other places. They uh, allowed... Uh, Jewish population to um, follow and administer their own laws. So, for example, if you stole something, right, this would be taken care of by Jewish law if parties were Jewish. And so normally, uh, where the Roman law would come in and, and take care of stuff, right, they allowed the, the Jewish law to supersede in cases. Now, where it did not is the uh, a death penalty um, had to go before Rome. So they, they, could, not, um, they could not execute people, right? But lower level crimes, lower level crimes and laws, uh, were allowed to be controlled by the Jewish laws. That's unique. Um, again, usually the Romans, again, required assimilation and that included their laws and cultures and customs. And here they're saying, no, no, you know what, you can, you can practice your Jewish laws and traditions and uh, we won't interfere. If the only other thing, right, uh, so except for the death penalty, they could not execute, that had to go before Rome, and uh, Roman citizens, right? Roman citizens could always appeal to Rome and Roman law. So if there was someone who was Jewish and they didn't want to follow Roman law because there were some of Jewish faith that were born, that were born Roman citizens. Um, you could supersede that by appealing. And this, so this tended to be for those who were not Roman, which a lot of the Jewish population was not technically Roman. They were a province of Rome. They were not Roman citizens, but there were exceptions to that. Um, or if a Roman citizen came into it, they technically could appeal, but, or they could follow the Jewish law. But so it was, it was allowing the Jewish people to police themselves and follow their religious beliefs and laws within uh, a specific amount of it. Again, if there was someone who they're claiming like murdered someone or was subversive to Rome, that got kicked up to Rome. And then they could absolutely could not execute people. That was only reserved for, for Romans. <laughs> in other words, we are the only ones that get to execute people. Thank you very much. So we enjoy that job too much. Um, and so that, that was the structure. So it is surprising, right, that they disliked Rome so much and constantly were trying to, um, <laughs> they were constantly trying to get out of it. Uh, they were hoping for them to overthrow um, and, and eventually end the oppression of Roman rule. Which, again, is just interesting considering um, how much freedom they actually had, but, you know, perspective and stuff that way. The other thing that we have that we have is important because of Jesus coming in as uh, proclaiming himself to be the Messiah is that there were two, two major uh, messianic prophecies uh, within the Jewish belief. One was that there would be a Messiah who would come and create a kingdom on earth. And that would be like, this was described with swords and fighting and conquering. So think, you know, warrior. And of course, for uh, the Roman, or for the Romans, for the Jewish uh, people, this meant potentially overthrow, or at least it was their long hope and desire, right? If that if a Messiah came, he was going to come with uh, awesome sword fighting skills and lead the people to overthrow the oppressive rulers of Rome. 
The other way, which was somewhat ignored during this period because, of course, what they really wanted was uh, someone to come just destroy their enemies, was the kingdom in heaven. Uh, and, and that meant um, this was more about peaceful, talked about spiritual belief, and preparing uh, a, a place in, uh, for the afterlife, right? Rather than the, this would be the current world. So the one that was favored at the time that Jesus comes around uh, is going to be the first one, the kingdom on earth, because that's the one that was going to overthrow Rome, or at least what they hoped. Um, and it's not surprising because here's the thing, Jesus does not claim that one, um, and they don't like him. After Jesus' death, several, several years later, another guy claims to be the Messiah, on, and he, he learned from Jesus' rejection, well, who knows, but he did, he didn't uh, pick that one. He said that he was there to lead the army to overthrow Rome, and they liked him. And they end up getting destroyed, but they liked him and thought he was the Messiah. So again, this, this one was the popular one at the time. Um, okay, so that's the background of um, the Jewish background and tradition of, of what Jesus then is born into. That gets us into the origins of Christianity. So this is going to be looking at the background of Jesus and his death and the establishment of the churches. And then last, well, lastly, but then the next thing is we'll get into how the Romans saw them. So, uh, first and foremost, right, uh, uh, boop, we spell his name right here. Jesus is born uh, into a Jewish family. That's why we had to um, look at the Jewish background. Uh, and, and so that does play a role within his development and progress and rejection and all that stuff that came into play. Around 30 years old, he began to um, actively preach, walking around and, and preaching to people out in the open, and uh, collected some apostles. Now, we don't know much about Jesus when he was younger, um, and this is why actually early uh, Christian literature is going to come in and be popular uh, later, not right now. Uh, later, as Christianity begins to grow, people are going to um, start creating Christian literature of speculation of like, well, what was Jesus like when he was a, a young boy? Um, and, and, and so uh, the good example of that would be uh, Dan Brown and uh, the Da Vinci Code, right? That, that, uh, his source material for that book was these apocrypha texts, these this, this genre of Christian literature, sometimes Gnostic Gospels, um, but it, it, was all, it was all Christian literature that was after Jesus, after the apostles were dead, um, but before the Christian church solidified under Constantine, you had this period in time, uh, third century um, uh, period, where people were writing under the pseudonym of apostles, but they had long been dead. Um, to give it a legitimacy. And so they did, they wrote like, so one was like about Jesus as a kid. And then it was uh, speculated, well, did he have powers when he was a kid? Did he gain them when he just started teaching? And so it assumed that he had powers um, when he was uh, a kid. And so it talks about like 10 year old Jesus, like uh, lasers shooting out of his eyes, killing a, a, a bird. <laughs> and then like freaking out and be like, oh my God, I killed a bird. He probably didn't say, oh my God, but he, I killed a bird. And so then he brings the bird back to life um things like that right there's another one that talks about jesus getting married and um, there's also other christian lit that talks about the apostles like hey we don't know a lot what happened between this period and this period with this apostle's life so they started writing stories about the apostle's life during that period um but as far as as uh accurate historical documents that that talk about jesus as a historical character in his younger years we have almost nothing what we do know and is generally believed is that he was a historical person. Um, he did teach. He was crucified by the Romans. And this is going to, really his death is going to kickstart off the Christian religion. So that's important thing. Jesus is the founder, but he doesn't create the Christian religion. That's going to be the apostles and Paul especially um, that are going to set up the church and and continue to get followers and stuff like that. So he's around 30 years old and he starts teaching. This uh, a rabbi or teacher uh, in Jewish tradition um, 
that that wasn't actually abnormal and there was the few records suggest that he was smart and that he potentially was training to be a rabbi um when he was younger so this this would have been on par that around 30 you begin teaching and apostles are like followers or students and so these things aren't in of itself uh abnormal uh right he has like groupies <laughs> but the you that that's the t the kind of the teaching model right you have a teacher you have the students and they learn from you he he definitely like said they go more groupy esque than they would have in the Jewish model and practice but it but it's not a weird thing or out of out of um, touch with what would have been happening of course what he begins preaching is where it, it goes off in a different direction but that part like said that he's actively preaching walking around and has apostles eh, that would have no one would have been batting an eye about that and they didn't not until he uh started preaching um we'll, we'll say the uh content of his his preaching upset the pharisees and this is then where it becomes problematic again not rome has no idea who he is yet um this is all within the jewish community um the Romans, no clue who he is, don't care. Um, they don't really like the uh, Judea province anyways, and they try to stay out of it. Um, you know, so <laughs> again, this is, this is still pre-Roman involvement. The Pharisees were uh, a ruling group. And what's interesting is there were, there were different types of um, names for different uh, uh, religious leaders. And they were a ruling group in two ways. I'm going to put two, but it really should be under that. One was in religion, and the other was in actual politics and, and society. And they um, combined them, right? So the, the uh, Jewish community didn't have a, a separate political so social rulers and then religious leaders. The, the, head, the, the religious leaders that were in charge were also the political and social leaders as well. During this time period, it was the Pharisees. They were big into biblical law and um, strict adherence to it and extra laws. Uh, and, and their kind of philosophy was, uh, we'll see, and extra laws. That the more laws, the better. Like, you know, if these are the laws that God provided for us, if we add like 45, 50, 100 more, um, you know, what's the harm in that? It just means that we're being extra careful and sure that we're following what we're supposed to do. Uh, and so they, yeah, they liked laws. They added a lot of laws that were, um, that were not in the biblical text in any way, uh, and very strict adherence to that. So they were the ones in charge. They did not like Jesus and they did not like Jesus, um, because he both directly and indirectly, um, challenged their teachings. He challenged uh, the nature of all of their um, it, his strict adherence to the law rather than like the spirit of the law um, and uh, challenged their, you know, what they'd been preaching and, and teaching the people. So they, they felt threatened by him um, and specifically, like I said, that their, um, you know, it was important, the elite political uh, status that they were concerned about and they didn't like him um, challenging that system. They felt like it undermined them in too many ways and then other people might challenge it as well as other religious leaders who might see this as an opportunity to be like, aha, now we can get rid of the Pharisees and take over and be the new leading group. So it really was about insulating and protecting themselves. Uh, and so they, they wanted him gone. And what they did is that they, interestingly enough, used the um, Roman system to do so. So um, they, they tried a couple different times. We'll say uh, tried a few times. Ultimately, they uh, uh, brought him in and arrested him for disturbing the peace. Now, here's the thing, right? They could, um, they could, uh, I don't know, arrest him for theft and you can't do the death penalty. They want him gone, gone. So they got to, they have to go to Rome and, but you can't just be like, uh, here provincial governor, uh, right. Who the, remember the, the governor, uh, for Rome was Pontius Pilate. 
Let me get that in there for you. Uh, and uh, he, Pontius Pilate, was um, the, the provincial governor of Rome. And the thing is, is that they, they can't just be like, hey, we don't like him, take him. You have to have, like, some reason. And it had to fit within the Roman expectation, because especially because they gave the Jewish people, they'd just be like, well, that's your law. You deal with him. And they're like, no, see, we want him dead. And they're going to say that. So we need you to do it. <laughs> so one of the things that they, you do, they did is that they said he was disturbing the peace. Um, right. And then that would be that would be important to Rome. Rome should pay attention because he was a, a threat to Rome, potentially subversive. And they used the good old he wants to be king. Um, and, and the Romans, remember, hated kingship. So they were hoping that these things then would would lead to um uh, Pontius Pilate, the provincial governor, um, f to uh, basically enact the death penalty for him. So what happens with that? Here, we'll put Jesus's death. Um, is that he does? He gets um, interviewed by provincial governor. And in fact, supposedly, and we don't know all the specifics, they didn't find anything wrong. And he brought him back and I was like, he doesn't seem subversive to Rome. And the uh, Pharisees basically put up a stink and said, we're going to revolt if you don't um, find him guilty. And remember, the provincial governor's job was to um, keep the peace, right? It's not the bad most part of it, but keep the peace. Well, Judea was especially known for its problems and uprisings. You pretty much, like, you almost got to think that the provincial governors that got stuck in Judea were being punished. No one was like, yes, I volunteer for a tribute to, you know, <laughs> Judea. Uh, it, it probably was a place where, like, you suck or you did something wrong. Here's your new position. And worse, though, you don't want to be the provincial governor that when there's a revolt. Um, that doesn't go well for you. So one of the things that they tended to do in Judea is, is once a year, they'd actually free a prisoner, kind of like a pl political prisoner to appease the people. Um, and so once they started threatening, he brought out Jesus and apparently one other criminal and was like, okay, who do you want me to free? Thinking they wouldn't pick the criminal and they picked the criminal. So uh, Jesus then is uh, uh, found guilty of treason to Rome. Treason to Rome um, that it definitely leads to, uh, the punishment of, uh, crucifixion. Uh, now crucifixion was for, reserved for non-Romans. If you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. So that was a benefit. You got your head chopped off, which was a lot faster. Crucifixion was painful. Crucifixion was, uh, definitely, uh, a, a Roman punishment. You know, the, the Christians are going to uh, adapt the, the cross, but it was a Roman punishment. It was meant for severe criminals, murderers, um, uh, rapists, uh, subversive people to Rome, maybe repeat offenders. So you might have occasionally thieves up there if they over and over and over again got caught stealing. But it was reserved for, for serious uh, criminals. Um, and so Jesus was crucified. Um, and what's interesting like that is that, right, that yes, he had the following, he had the apostles, he went around teaching, but Christianity hadn't spread uh, almost at all. After his death, well, with Christian uh, beliefs and tradition, let's talk about that first. And then we'll look at what we know historically. Uh, the, with the Christian um, belief and tradition, here's the important things with, with that. Uh, one is that uh, Jesus um, uh, died, but then ro or was, was resurrected, which is why you have um, the celebration of, of Easter. So resurrected. Um, and um, that his death on the cross was seen as the um, ultimate sacrifice. So uh, with uh, the Jewish 
population and pretty much all polytheistic religions as well there was an, you had to sacrifice like animals or incense or things like that so uh, for Christians though uh, no need had no need to sacrifice right and could pray directly to God and the belief with this was um, because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. His death um, bridged the gap between God and people, which is what sacrifice was supposed to do to allow for communication. And now you could pray directly to God and you didn't have to sacrifice stuff. Then, of course, the resurrection was an important part. He um, then within the Christian belief and story, he was resurrected. He taught for a while, performed miracles. Uh, let's put that. Uh, after uh, uh, rising from dead, he uh, taught and performed miracles. And then he uh, ascended back into heaven. Went back to heaven. Floated up into heaven. So this then, if th so that's the Christian... Uh, beliefs and traditions. What happens after his death that we do know for sure historically is after death apostles that definitely did hide and deny that they knew who he was when he was being crucified and totally understand why crucifixion sucks and does not look like something you'd want to do and so if they knew you, they seem to be hunting down followers of Jesus you'd be like eh, I'm, I, you know I'm good things really don't want to be crucified today I'm gonna just hide out here or pretend I don't know him because I don't want to die um, and so after the so they did uh, during that period where he was uh, brought in and then crucified they got, apostles kind of just laid low after his death though the apostles began uh, not only to teach, um, but spread out and actively establish Christianity and the early church. So it really um, was the apostles that established early Christianity. Uh, after Jesus's death Jesus so think that's the easiest way to think of it Jesus is the founder the apostles were the ones that established the the early church um, let's do the early church let's just put it under here since we were talking about it um, early churches and, and and Paul who was Jewish who converted to Christianity was one of the biggest uh, uh, individuals to impact the development of the Christian church. Early churches were not like um, public places. They were um, home churches. In part, that was because um, they, they weren't initially at odds with the Romans, but it was largely uh, poor populations that were uh, attracted to Christianity. Um, be, and in part, that's because you have Rome. Uh, the poor people were definitely, and women, um, and um, non-Romans were disenfranchised. And uh, disenfranchised and, and ignored in all ways in Rome. And Christianity gave them a community. This is what made them so popular, is that you had a, a sense of community and structure and people that cared that Rome, Rome didn't. And then uh, it was also with the apostles traveling around preaching and establishing churches. But the home churches uh, were just in people's homes. Women had a large role in the early church because um, they were in their homes and women could be deaconesses they were the ones that were opening up their um their homes they were the ones that were participating in a very active way within early christianity that will change when um the church tries to become more legitimate within the roman world 
Okay, so that's the early structure. How did the Romans see the Christians then? Right up to this point, uh, they would have been they would have been like uh, Christians who, huh? <laughs> they don't know anything, and they didn't. Romans um, did not know anything about them. And if there was any, um, you know, noise about this Christian group, uh, if they if they knew any inkling or just the name, it was believed to be a Jewish sect, right? So it was just part of it was some some Jewish group that broke from the other the, the Jewish internal Jewish squabbles. There were the Romans didn't care. Why would they care? Why would they know? So like, you know, one of the questions is asked is, oh, well, how come there's no Roman sources about Jesus being crucified? And you're like, because why? <laughs> they crucify people all the time. The provincial governors were responsible for that. Um, it wouldn't have made waves in Rome, in the capital in Rome with the emperor. Uh, th that, there was no reason to make waves with the, with the uh, emperor. So, so you don't have an awareness of the Christians at the beginning. Uh, you don't have it through Jesus' death. It actually takes place with the emperor Nero. Right? Nero is going to be the first Roman emperor who is going to um, bring awareness to the Christians. So just to give you an idea of timeline, is Jesus died under the reign of Tiberius. Right? So you have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, right? Let's uh, just, let's put those up just so we remember the timeline. Uh, Tiberius is then when you're going to have Jesus died. Again, not that Tiberius knew who he was. Then you have Caligula, the crazy one. Uh, Claudius, who was just seen as a buffoon. And then Nero, who was also the crazy one. And this is going to be, you're going to have, um, the first persecution of Christians um, under Nero. So, right, one, two, well, he was born under Augustus, but that's not fair to claim that there's any knowledge there. Let's say Tiberius. So one, two, three, three, the fourth emperor uh, of which Christianity is around before there's recognition by the Romans of it, right? So that, it takes a while. Why? How this happens is that you have the great fire in Rome. The problem with parts of Rome um, is that um, <laughs> Rome had no building codes. Let's just say that. Uh, lots of buildings. If you were wealthy and lived in a villa outside of the city, then good for you. You had a nice home. But the average, most of the people um, lived in poorly constructed buildings um that whoa don't that was weird it's like it had a brain fart my computer had a brain fart on what it was doing and now <laughs> a race let me rewrite that that t doesn't want to there we go constructed try that again there they were close to each other what is going on i must be hitting something with my hand and um, uh, there was no organized fire department. One of the things, and this will come into play when we look at the structure of how they saw Christians, uh, uh, an organized fire department was seen as an association. That's what they called them. And um, there were what were from associations legal associations and illegal. Illegal ones had the Roman emperor's approval. They were hard to get. Um, the only one really that was, was the burial. There will be some firemen uh, associations later. The burial association was allowed. And that one was you could meet um, and um, you uh, put a donation in once a month and it gave you a sense of community you had a meal and the idea was for the lower classes who couldn't afford a proper burial is by everyone putting in a little bit right that you when you died you get a proper burial plus all the people in the the burial association would come to your funeral and once a month you got a community uh that was one of the few that was allowed 
Most were illegal associations, almost any other large meeting that didn't have state approval. Uh, Firemen's Association, why they were often seen as illegal is that there was often a belief um, that um, they would be, um, they would turn political. In fact, Trajan, who we're going to look at in a minute, Pliny writes to the Emperor Trajan. His argument was when, when, tra when Pliny asked for a fire association, they always turn political and political always turns subversive, right? And so, nah, we don't want to have that. So you have no fire department, poorly constructed. Um, all of that leads to the fire destroying Ro the city of Rome. It um, destroyed most of the district. So there have been fires before. Um, but this one, um, uh, ended up, um, most of the districts were, uh, gone. So what happens and why this is a problem at all is that Nero had, in a poor decision, um, decided to brag that he could get rid of Rome and rebuild it so much better. So then there started to be spread that uh, Nero had set the fire. And um, I mean, this is the famous saying, there wasn't a fiddle back then, it's what it got turned into, that Nero sang um, or played the lyre uh, on a hill while Rome burned. So this is what started, the rumors started going on. Now, Nero was actually out of town at the time. Um, this is this is the rumor. Let's put that, I want to be clear. He didn't set the fire. <laughs> he was out of town. But it, it, the, the popular saying today is that Rome, Rome, uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Uh, Nero fiddled on the hill while Rome burned. No fiddle back then, but he could have played the lyre or sang. He loved to sing. So more likely, Nero sang on the hill while Rome burned. And so he came back into town and tried to fix it and provide aid. Um, but he had a hard time shaking those rumors that, uh, he was the one that started the fire and he didn't want to have that happen. Uh, and so he was, he was looking for a scapegoat, right? Who can I blame? Because it's, I, I'm, it can't be me, <laughs> um, being the one that's responsible for this. And so what happens is his wife uh, tells him about uh, the Christians. And she had apparently heard uh, from her servant who was Jewish. Um, and so she told him about the Christians, said that, that they, he, they would be great to blame because no one likes him anyway. Um, and so he does. He blames the Christians for the fire in Rome. Now this is a very um, targeted attack. One of the misconceptions is that uh, this is where you have widespread persecution. This was specific uh, persecution in the city of Rome. If you were uh, a Christian outside of the city of Rome, um, nothing happened to you. Right, so the, there's going to be a widespread Roman persecution in uh, with Diocletian later, but this one was very localized because he's using the Christians as scapegoats for the fire itself, um, and so this is where Romans hear of the name Christian for the first time. Um, what he did is that they they so they they found people right, they brought people in, they tortured them, and um, made them do two things: confess and name uh, of, of starting the fire and name names. And the reality is as you're tortured, uh, you know, that, that you're likely to share those things. And then they killed, he killed lots of Christians in the city of Rome. So that's important again. Um, this happened in the city. If you were a Christian elsewhere, you know, um, then y y nothing really happened. Even uh, Tacitus, who was, Tacitus was a Roman historian, uh, said everyone knew that they were scapegoats, right? He said everyone knows the Christians didn't do it, that Nero made it up. 
Um, but they're, they're annoying. <laughs> he basically said, but they're annoying anyways, so they kind of deserve it. Um, but so you do have a Roman historian saying everyone knew Christians didn't start the fire. Nonetheless, um, this creates, um, uh, a, a, a con the consequence of this is that it, it's going to create kind of the first thing under Nero. Um, we'll put it as C because it's kind of the first thing in, in the list of how they saw them is uh, the connotation of, of uh, the name. We'll say meaning of the name Christian. So one of the first things is that for the Romans, the name had significance. There was importance to the reputation of your name. And the name Christian, Romans became aware of Christians, of the name Christian, through Nero and starting the fire. And that gave it a negative connotation. So from the start, um, through accusations of the fire. So from the start, right, Christian became associated with bad and, um, criminal activity, criminal, even if they hadn't done it, it didn't matter. Um, you ended up with this, this negative connotation attached to it because of Nero using them as a scapegoat. Now, eventually Nero was pr like, he was vicious and even the Romans lacked, uh, disliked, um, uh, how far he went. And he eventually was forced to stop because people started talking about him again and going like, oh my God, can you, do you see what Nero's doing? Like those poor Christians and his whole scapegoat plan was starting to backfire because they started to feel bad for the Christians. And so he stopped. Um, and so after this period, right, the, one of the first things that happens is that you get a negative name. People become aware of Christianity as separate from Jewish. Uh, that would be the other thing, right? Separate uh, from Jewish belief. Uh, and that it has a negative connotation um, that it's a bad, their name, right, means bad and criminal. This is going to be important later because we're going to look at um, Christians defending themselves. And they bring that up. They say, we have done nothing wrong. We have been accused of no crime. It is just the name alone that, that uh, makes us guilty. And, and basically saying, right, that's not fair. After that, though, what you have is a, a general lull in, in interest in Christianity. There is no... Um, I don't know where we should put that. It's going to uh, keep it separate. I guess we'll just uh, tack it on to, to here. There is, so there's a, a lull in interest in Christianity after this event, right? So they get the negative name, um, but there isn't an empire-wide, that's the important part, no empire-wide policy on the Christians. Instead, what happens is it's going to be left to the individual provincial governors, right, that we talked about, to deal with cases um, as they uh, arrive. So if there's an issue, um, um, you know, then, then they'll deal with it then. During this time, even though there's a little interest and it's left to the provincial governor, governors, you do have an increase in growth in Christianity because throughout all of this, even though, cause you do have periods where there's no persecution and stuff like that. It attracts interest in the poor and more and more poor people, women and non-Romans first. And this increases significantly. However, you do begin moving to uh, Roman citizens first poor, and then lastly, educated and wealthy Roman citizens. Um, so it does expand and grow. And as you have more and more Romans begin to convert to Christianity, um, then you're going to see an uptick in uh, people accusing the Christians of just being Christian and provincial governors dealing with it um, as, as well as um, uh, a renewed interest in defense of Christianity and, and how the Romans are responding. 
Um, okay, so what we're going to look at is, is um, just to show this idea of right that there is, uh, it's left to the provincial governors um, and uh, Roman, Paul, so oops, provincial governors and uh, Roman policy towards Christians. So this is going to be with one of the readings that we did. Um, the, it's going to be plenty and Trajan, right? So Trajan was the Roman emperor. Pliny was the provincial governor. Um, and uh, we're going to look at, he wrote, he wrote a ton of letters to Trajan. Trajan seemed to be fine with that, but like, you got to wonder, there's, I have a whole book on letters that Pliny wrote to Trajan. He wrote about everything. You got to wonder if like Trajan would get letters from Pliny and be like, oh my God, it's Pliny again. This guy cannot do anything on his own. Um, and so one of the things that happens with Pliny and uh, Trajan, right, is that Pliny um, wants to know how to deal with the Christians. So just remember that Trajan is several emperors later after Nero. It's, it's many, many years after Nero. And, and there's a provincial governor that doesn't know what to deal with the Christians because he has never had to deal with it. So that shows you, um, not you, it shows deal with it. It shows us, though, and it shows you um, that Christianity, there wasn't this widespread persecution or that everyone even knew what to do. You have plenty of provincial governor many, many years later going, this is the first time I've had to deal with someone bringing forth accusations against Christians. What do I, what do I do in this situation? Um, so let, let's go ahead and, and look, um, actually I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll say the one part and then we'll, we'll read more, uh, clearly what he does establish is okay. If people then are brought before court, uh, well, um, first accused of being Christian. Okay. That's the first part. Uh, and then brought before court. This is the policy he comes up with. And what he's going to do is he's going to ask, are you Christian? Right? If you say no, then uh, you sacrifice to the emperor, right? Show that you're, you know, Christians won't sacrifice to the emperor. And if you do that, free to go. If you say yes, he says he um, reminded them what would happen, which is death. S slow here. I'm going to pause it for a second. Just saying, remind them what happened. And if they insisted, then they were killed. Well, one of the things that's important, we talked about sacrifice, right? If you said no, then you sacrificed and went. So this was the whole sacrifice again. Remember we talked about sacrifice was central and mixed. And this is where there's going to be that conflict for Christianity. Romans felt that the Christians should sacrifice to the gods. And they didn't see what the problem was. Because for the Romans, right, sacrifice... was an outward expression of loyalty. They didn't care if you actually believed in um, the, the religion to Rome. Remember how we talked about that their religion was intermixed with the duty to Rome and the success of Rome. So sacrifice was an outward expression of loyalty to Rome and duty as a Roman um, citizen or, you know, provincial individual. So for them, and they straight up said, we don't care whether you believe, you don't have to believe in any of the gods. There's plenty of Romans who don't just go through the motions to show you're loyal to Rome. And the Christians be like, we are, we'll pray for the emperor. We want Rome to succeed, but we can't sacrifice. And they'd be like, why? That makes no freaking sense. Um, and that this becomes the crux of the problem. This is the issue. There's going to be other things tied to it, but this is a major issue the Romans have with the Christians. 
and it's going to lead to them seeing them in other ways that are problematic and attack. Basically, the Romans are going to see the Christians as attacking not only Rome and the success of Rome, but Roman culture and their prosperity within that system. Right. Okay. So that's what Pliny does. Um, we're going to expand upon this in just a second, um, but I want to look at the source itself. So we're going to take, I'm going to pause it just for a second, figure out why it, it's kind of uh, uh, stalling here. And then we're going to look at that source. Okay, so here is Pliny the Younger. These are the letters. This is Pliny to Emperor Trajan. Um, and so let's look at this one first. And we're talking about, um, you know, the he, Pliny again, provincial governor. And so he's writing to the emperor um, about his experiences. So it is, my pra it is my practice, my lord, to refer to you all matters concerning which I am in doubt, which is my joke that in reading his letters, he says a ton of letters. For who can give can better give guidance to my hesitation or inform my ignorance? I have never participated in the trials of Christians. Right. So right there shows this was not a common thing that that at the average Roman dealt with, let alone even the provincial governors. I therefore do not know what offenses. <clears throat> sorry, it is the practice to punish or investigate, and to what extent. And I have been not—I have been not a little hesitant as to whether there should be any distinction on account of age or no difference between the very young and the more mature, whether pardon is to be granted for repentance or if a, if a man once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one, whether the name itself, it, even without offense, or if only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. So right here we have the name question come up, right? But this is all the right that because there was um, there was no empire wide policy, okay. So he's basically he's like I don't know what I'm doing, help me out. And then and then the funny part is and then he proceeds to just go through the trial anyway. And then it's like actually you know what I just did the trial anyway, so I'm just gonna tell you what I did and you can let me know if that was right or wrong. So it's kind of funny, right? Because he's like, I don't know, so I feel like I should ask you and you can help me and tell me what to do. But then he totally just does the trial but and then puts that in the letter, which feels like it's defeating the entire point. What if Trajan wrote back and was like, no, what the hell are you doing? Don't do that. It's a little late now, isn't it? Versus like, here's what I'm going to, we're going to not try. I'm, I'm going to ask for your advice. Here's what I want to do. Is that correct? No, I'm just going to go ahead and do it and then you can let me know. <laughs> Um, so, meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christian, I have observed the following procedure. So, here's what he did, right? I interrogated the, the, these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Uh, that means uh, killing them and, and probably and tor torture first. I, I guess I've got these backwards. They didn't kill and then torture. Torture and killing. So, he's, he's saying, like, look. I asked if they're Christians. They said yes. I said, "Are you sure? Are you really sure about that? Because here's the thing. Um, you know, uh, you're gonna get killed, right? So I'm gonna ask you again. Are you Christian? Yes. Oh, really? Are you really sure about that? Because maybe you didn't understand the whole torture and killing thing. Let's let's maybe show some of that pain and torture." And then, and then kill you. Really? So like, he's like, I gave them lots of chances. Um, and those who persisted, I ordered executed. Now here's an interesting part, right? For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy sur surely deserves to be punished. Stubbornness, inflexible obstinacy right that he's saying no matter what like the fact of how stupid they are they kind of deserve to be executed because i warned them like three times that i was going to execute them why would not just say no like the, the, and this is the roman position though like i it is it, 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 i'm i'm you know it's joking with it but but this was their position like look i warned them three times why what the hell is wrong with them all they had to do was say no and then sacrifice to the emperor. Like, they chose death over that? Like, how stupid do you have to be? That was how the Romans viewed it, right? Then the, this part here with that, and no matter whatever is their crimes, their, their stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy kind of deserve what they got coming to them. 
There were others possessed of the same folly, but because they were Roman citizens, I cited order for them to be transferred to Rome. There it shows what happens when you're a Roman citizen. You get prefer uh, preferential treatment. Uh, soon accusations spread, as usually happens, because of the proceedings going on, and several incidents occurred. An anonymous document was published containing the names of many persons. Those who denied that they were or had been Christians when they invoked the gods and words dictated by me offered prayer with incense and wine to your image, which I had ordered brought for this purpose, and moreover cursed Christ, none of the which those who are really Christians is said can be forced to do. So here is the sacrifice um, to prove not Christian. Right, and he's saying that supposedly, if they really are Christian, they can't do those things, and they and they aren't, and 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 even if they were thinking about doing this sacrifice, um, then cursing uh, Christ would be the right the the kind of linchpin of it not working. But these I thought should be discharged. So, if you were if they were on the list and he they said no, I'm not Christian. They're like, okay, sacrifice, curse the image of Christ. You're free to go. Clearly, you're not a Christian, or you're not anymore. Um, others named by the informant declared that they were Christian, but then denied it, asserting that they had been, but had ceased to be some three years before, others many years, some as much as 25. They all worshipped your image and the statues of the gods and cursed Christ. Now, so here's the interesting part, right? They asserted, however, so, so then he has, he said these people who claim that they used to be Christian, but they're not anymore, they defend Christianity. So, so uh, they're they're uh, supposedly right. They they said, yeah, we were Christians, but we're not anymore. Here, we'll sacrifice to the gods, uh, you know, curse Christ. But we were going. They did. They defend Christianity to him. They asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a god, and to bind themselves by oath, not some crime. But not and not to commit fraud, theft, adultery, not falsify their trust, nor refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. Um, whoa! This tells us <laughs> how does that zoom in from from me, that slight touch? I want to know how it gets that massive. Um, where? Let's see if we can find it again now. Come on. Hmm. One tiny touch in this thing decides that means zoom in into insane amounts. Okay, what I wanted to say with that before it decided to uh, zoom in on its own volition, my computer apparently is having its own thoughts today, um, is that this is, again, oh, these are things the Romans saw the Christians as. All right, because what do we have? Fraud, theft, adultery, falsified trust, crime. And they're saying, no, no, they didn't do any of that. Their only issue was meeting, singing to a, hymns to a god, and those are accustomed to depart and assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. We're going to come back to that when we look at Minicius Felix Octavius, because he's going to talk about what food he thinks the Christians are eating. Even this they affirmed they had ceased to do after my edict in appearance with your instructions because I had forbidden political associations. So that's the other one. Um, let's put up here. Um, right, so we had the name. Um, what, where, what number are we on? C, D, E. So we're on E here. Um, political. This, this could be like a, a, a couple different things, right? They saw the Christians as political, foreign, illegal associations. All right, we're going to come back and we'll write more on that in a minute. Um, but he mentions that, right? He's saying, when I banned uh, these, these political uh, foreign associations, uh, political associations, right, they said they stopped. Accordingly, I judged all the more necessary to find out the, tr the truth, and so apparently to find out the truth is to torture people. The two female slaves who were called deaconesses. This is important here, because this tells us women's role in the church. Women had a, a bigger role in the church, and these were slaves who were deaconesses. 
This is going to go away when the church becomes more formal under Constantine, but they had a big role. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. That's going to be the other one. Um, here, we'll come back and, and, and talk about these. Well, I already, I already kind of talked about uh, associations and stuff. but So that's, that's the other one. Political association, the name, uh, superstition. I therefore postpone the investigation and hasten to consult you, for the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because of the number involved. And then it says that there were all these different ages and stuff like that. Uh, for the contagion of the superstition had spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and farms. Seems possible to check and cure. Um, right, it, because as soon as he said, as soon as these um, trials started happening, uh, the religious rites long neglected are being resumed. Everywhere sacrificial animals are coming from which very few people purchased. This shows that there was a concrete um, action. Um, their Christians weren't buying meat that was sacrificed. Um, and they weren't participating. No, I don't want to leave. Stay. I, I feel like my computer is, is, is haunted and doing its own thing here. Um, so the thing is, is that the, the Christians weren't buying sacrificed meat and um, they wouldn't participate in certain religious festivals. This is showing us that it had a, a, a clear, visible impact on certain areas in Roman society. Now, I would not claim over the entire Roman Empire. But certain provinces and areas, it was noticeable. And so this is part of the reason why then the Romans perceived the Christians as, as dangerous. Because they seemed to be threatening the way of, um, of, of Roman life. Then Trajan writes back and is like, yeah, you did everything right. Except, this is important too, because it's showing you that this wasn't just go out and, and capture and kill all Christians. Not until Diocletian. He said... Um, it is not, yes, it is not possible to lay down a general rule, serve as a kind of fixed standard. They're not to be sought out. If they are denounced and proven guilty, they are to be punished with this reservation. But whoever denies he is Christian really proves it by worshiping our gods, even though he's under a suspicion of the past, will be repardoned. No anonymous accusations have any role in prose prosecution, for this is a dangerous kind of precedent in keeping with the spirit of our age. That's impressive to me in the sense that he's like, you, you can't take anonymous stuff. That's crap. No anonymous accusations, right? That's a dangerous precedent uh, for people being convicted and stuff. So that, that's plenty. Um, the, the younger. We're going to look at um, Minicius Felix Octavius in just a second. This is a Roman. So this is a Roman sharing what he's heard. Of the next one, this one right here, Minicius Felix Octavius, is um, a Roman sharing what he's heard about the Christians. So just, so we talked about foreign illegal associations, right? Those were things like the burial club and meetings. And that, and that, um, uh, well, let's erase the superstition for just a second because I do want to make sure it's clear. So political associations were essentially meetings of larger groups. Um, they tended to have a connection to eating food. So the fact that the Christians met for breakfast or a supper um, often was in that. Um, and, and then, um, it was, it was just gatherings really, but that you had these different names for them, right? Political, foreign, illegal, um, all were technically illegal if you didn't get it sanctioned. Not everything was political or foreign. One of the reasons you get foreign described in it is because it became I, the idea that Christianity, uh, was a foreign religion because it was not like anything that they had seen before. Um, and so they, they said it must come from some foreign belief. Illegal because it's not sanctioned. Um, and the political, um, that's really because of the be Roman belief that um, all uh, associations become political, really. Okay, I mean, so so that that's really um, that that part of it and stuff. With with plenty though, right? Um, the accusations that I wanted to continue with that. Um, let's see. I I guess I added that in there, and then we should include it within plenty. We'll just do. Um, 
here, continuation of Pliny. Right, because I, I, I wanted to point out those things I did on there real quick with it, that he, he lists, it's not just the name, right? You have that, that stubbornness um, that he mentions, the extreme stubbornness um, and uh, what, inflexible obstinacy. Yeah, inflexible obstinacy. And that's uh, the idea because they refuse to sacrifice. There's an emphasis on the importance of sacrifice, right? And and just basically common sense. And then as we mentioned, the association, the fact that that was that they were they were deemed an association, and then uh, superstitious. So these are all the things that he he mentions. Oh, and then the other that we talked about, right? The female. Deaconesses, uh, which just shows women's role within the church, in the early church, because it is going to change. Okay, so that then leaves us with superstition. And what does it mean with superstition as far as what, why is that seen as bad? What is it that, that they specifically are arguing for um, with uh, the superstitious. Well, one of the things is that the Romans saw themselves um, as extremely pious, which is interesting, right? Because uh, um, uh, the religion and state were intertwined. But for many, um, it was more... Um, about your outward actions than, um, you know, your actual beliefs. And the government was tolerant of religions. Um, so the Roman government was tolerant of other religions as long as the cult, as they called it, right? Any new cult did not weaken Roman uh, morality. So what does that mean, right? This was, this was an actual like Roman statement. And what they saw is that they saw the Christians as doing exactly this. Um, and it is the, we'll, we're going to read Meniscus Felix Octavius and we'll look at what he calls superstitious, all right? Because there's, there's several things with it, but the, and it's, it's part of, uh, rituals and practices that they don't understand, that the Romans don't understand. So one of them, we'll put the first one and then we're going to read Meniscus Felix here was this idea of refusal to sacrifice. They saw this as a superstitious reason. Like, you've got some, you know, superstitious, silly reason that has no foundation. Sacrifice has been part of religious structure for ages. Why is this a problem, right? And they didn't understand that at all. Okay, so Meniscus Felix, we're not gonna read every all of it. This is a good one. If you have not paid close attention to this, you really should. Okay, in view of this, it is not, is it not an absolute scandal? You will allow me, I hope, to be rather forthright about the strong feelings I have for my case. Is it not scandalous that the gods should be mobbed by a gang of outlawed, reckless desperados? They have collected from the lowest possible dregs of society the more ignorant fools, together with gullible women, readily persuaded this is their weak sex. They have thus formed a rabble of blasphemous conspirators who with their nocturnal assemblies, periodic fast, and inhuman feasts seal their pact not with some religious ritual but with desecrating profanation. They lurk in hiding places, shunning the light. They are speechless in public but gabble away in corners. He definitely sees this as the superstitious stuff. And later subversive, which is the last part. They divide. So he's, he's saying, right, one, this shows the Roman view of of the poor and women right as well look at those uh, the 
the ignorant fools, dregs of society, the, pos the dregs of society, right? Blasphemous conspirators, nocturnal assemblies, periodic fasts, inhuman feasts. They despise our temples as being no more than sculptures. They spit after our gods. They sneer at our rights. And fantastic though it is, our priests they pity. Pitiable themselves. They scorn the purple robes of office, though they go about in rags themselves. Now this was rejection of um, political work in Rome. Right, as long as there was many early Christians uh, refused to participate in the political aspect of Rome because they saw it as so intertwined with pagan religion, right? But here's the thing with that that's significant to the Romans. The Romans, duty to Rome before the self. And that was that height. We looked at that with Marcus Cato the Elder, right? The height of serving Rome. And then now you have these Christians who are, are rejecting that, right? How amazingly stupid, unbelievably insolent they are. Tortures of the present they scoff, but they live in dread of uncertain tortures of the future. They're afraid to die after they are dead, but in the meantime, they have no fear of death. So here, this is again that idea of, of right, that they're afraid to die after death, which is, uh, they're not afraid of tortures. It's the refusal to denounce being Christian. For fear of uh, when they die, right, uh, going to heaven uh, or not, and that's what he's saying there. But this is how this this is the best one for seeing how the Romans viewed these things. They recognize each other. They recognize each other by secret marks and signs. So that's an important part, right? Uh, secret marks and signs. The fact that um, they um, afraid to die after death, um, scorn the purple robes of office. He would have seen all of this stuff as superstitious nonsense, right? They're just so ignorant and superstitious. Why are they, you know, uh, doing all these weird things that, that makes no sense and afraid of this? Um, so they meet each other by secret marks and signs. Hardly have they met when they love each other uh, throughout the world, uniting in a practice of veritable religion of lust. Indiscriminately, they call each other brother and sister, thus turning even ordinary fornication into incest. Okay, so superstition would have been um, the opposite of, of pious as well. So uh, he talks about incest, the idea of um, brother and sister. Wait, wait, love this this comes from okay so there's there's this and one other we'll put the other um which is um eating people specifically he's gonna mention it as babies so this cannibalism these two come from practices that they don't understand um right um eating people and and, and this idea of drinking their blood and eat in their body. This comes from communion, right? It's uh, the bread and the wine. And, and later for, for Catholicism, it's going to believe that it actually transmutates and, and, and was Christ's blood and, and, and body who, who transforms into that other uh, Christian beliefs. It's not. It's just um, bread and wine, but it's a representation of what Jesus sacrificed. But so that's still being hashed out here in this phase. So there's there's no there's no clear um, structured belief yet on or orthodox system with this. They're still just figuring that out. But they did practice communion even back then. Um, based on kind of the Last Supper that Jesus had with the apostles that then got passed down as part of the stories. And, it, and he said in that, um, drink this or eat this uh, in remembrance of me. This, eat this, this is my body, eat, you know, eat this in remembrance of me. Drink this, this is my blood, drink this in remembrance of me. And that was part of the communion ritual. But they were eating bread and wine and drinking wine. But, but if you don't understand Christianity, and especially in this pit, Period and the and they the Christians weren't being open completely because they did have special signs to show that they were Christian because you could get taken to court and killed. So yeah, they didn't have neon flashing signs that said Christian Church here, come on, come on, let's go, go ahead, Romans, execute us. Now that's going to come later. They are going to do that later, but at this point they're still kind of being like, eh, I kind of like my life. 
so we're going to put a sign that shows that other Christians will know where a Christian church is, but we're not going to have flashy signs for you to figure out everything that's going on. But if a Roman overhears, this is my body, eat this in remembrance of me, this is my blood, drink this in remembrance of me, it sure sounds cannibalistic. Likewise, they were told to greet each other as brother and sister in Christ, which doesn't mean... In a, they were actual brother and sister, but in Rome, the the that language was taken more seriously, um, and and to claim brother and sister was often then seen as actual brother and sister. So it's not surprising, and then that then gets translated into this idea of, of incest, um, and then the see the signs and marks they did have some. All right, we're going to look at those in just a second. Let's finish this reading, and, and, and uh, this shows the superstitious. There's going to be the subversive part, too. Um, and then we'll look at those pictures. I do want to show you with that. Um, okay. Uh, it is also reported they worship the genitals of their pontiff and priests, adoring, it appears, the sex of their father. <laughs> and then I like how he's like, perhaps that's incorrect. You know, I've, I've stated all this other outlandish stuff, but maybe that's correct. It certainly is suspicious that befits their clandestine and nocturnal ceremonies again this is seen as not only superstitious but potentially subversive and that's going to be our, our last one right it's going to be the ones that we're looking at it's the name it's that it's a, a political foreign illegal association it's that they're superstitious and that they're subversive Right? These are the things that the Romans saw the Christians as. Okay? And we, we're backing that up and seeing that through these documents. Um, and, and the nocturnal uh, ceremonies could be both superstitious but potentially subversive because you're hiding and, and lurking about at night. What are you doing? Right? Uh, there are also stories about objects of their veneration. They are said to be a man who was punished with death as a criminal and the fell wood of his cross. Uh, thus providing suitable liturgy for the depraved fiends. They worship what they deserve. So again, here this is Jesus crucified. And they're for the Romans, right? Crucifixion meant it was some serious criminal. And he's like, so they're, they're worshiping? Their God is someone who we crucified? You've got to be kidding me, right? That was also seen as superstitious. We should put that one. Uh, that uh, Jesus... Uh, well, we'll put it as what they said, right? That their uh, their God was crucified, which equals criminal to Romans, and that would be super uh, very superstitious as well. They like you, you're we killed your God, <laughs> and and he was obviously a horrible criminal if we crucified him. To turn another point, the notoriety of their stories of the in initiation of new recruits is matched by its ghastly horror. A young baby is covered over with flour, the object being to deceive the unwary. So they're claiming that there's a baby and they put flour so that people don't know that it's a baby. And then it is, is served before the, the person to be admitted into their right. So this is this he's claiming this is the initiation to become Christian. Is that the baby is put in front of you covered in flour and apparently you don't know it's a baby because it's not moving or making sounds and it's flour is 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 distorting it the recruit is urged to inflict blow onto it they appear to be harmless because of the covering of flour thus the baby is killed with wounds that remain unseen and concealed so they're claiming right that basically like they they trick people into joining because they make you kill a baby and then you're you're like oh shit i killed a baby what am i supposed to do now i guess i'm a christian <laughs> it's not this there's no such this practice did not happen by the way um but but this these are the crazy rumors that the romans heard about the christians right it is the blood of this infant i shudder to mention it it is the blood that they lick with thirsty lips these are the limbs they distribute eagerly this is the victim by which they seal their covenant it is by complicity in this crime that they pledge mutual silence. So again, this is connected to communion and not understanding what communion was. Um, you end up with this misunderstanding. And then, of course, you know, tale after tale being spread around. And the rumors probably started off something small and became this much more elaborate structure. We all know about the banquets. This is just that they're having sex, orgies. 
right? Orgies. And then it says, but that means the blah, 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 everyone does it. I'm deliberately passing over a number of points. Those that I've already given are more than enough and that all of them or practically all are true is revealed by the very obscurity which shrouds this perverted, these perverted religions. Why else should they go to such pains to hide and conceal whatever it is they worship? One is always, ap always happy for honorable actions to be made public. Crimes are kept secret. Why do they have no altars, no temples, no publicly known images? So that's also where this is seen as superstitious. No altars, images, and places of worship. Right, so the, for the Romans, this is a uh, legitimacy, right? So if you don't have this, it's superstitious. You're lacking legit. You're lacking legitimacy. And then the last one, which I mentioned, is going to move into subversive nature of things. Um, it must be that whatever they worship and suppress is deserving of punishment or shame. So this goes into, again, meeting in secret and hiding, meeting at night, right? That um, honest and lawful things are done out in the open. That was the Roman belief. So if you're hiding it, it either means ashamed or illegal, right? And we're going to get into more subversive in just a second here, but that's part of it, right? Furthermore, who is this unique God of theirs? What is his origin? Where does he live? So solitary, so forlorn, that no free nation has knowledge of him. So again, it's this, that's where that foreign part came from nor any empire, not even the religious fanatics of Rome. The only other group to have worshipped one god is the wretched tribe of the Jews, but they did so in the open with temples and altars and with sacrifice and ceremony. So that this is that key, right? Sacrifice, rituals, and ceremony. They're like, even the Jews who we hate, at least they did it on the open and they, did, they had sacrifice. Sacrifice and I, we mentioned this already, but I'm going to put it again. It's super important. This was the outward expression of loyalty to Rome. So uh, to refuse to sacrifice was essentially saying you were not loyal to Rome and against their success. Um, we'll say that. that that's, that's the idea with that. And so, and, the, and they didn't understand why the Christians wouldn't sacrifice. They, 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 they saw it as, um, they, again, for the Romans, it was, you don't have, no one's making you believe anything. Just go through the motions. There was, um, there was one uh, Roman uh, senator who even said, I go to the, the games, the gladiator games, and I hate it. But it's my obligation as a Roman. It's my duty to do, right? But I don't like it. I think it's wrong. You don't have to believe it. You just have to, you know, go through the thing. And so the other part we saw with Pliny, right, is that, that um, Christians rejection of Roman tradition such as uh, threatened Rome and thus they were subversive as well and from that you get right uh, buying sacrificed meat participating in rituals Come on, computers are really struggling today. Rituals, um, participating in games. And it went further than that, right? We mentioned before to you that he essentially shunned the robes of office. 
not being part of Roman government. Then even so far, it's not mentioned in these. These were all mentioned in the sources, but one that wasn't is that uh, some soldiers refused to fight once they converted to Christianity because they saw that that whole the killing part as, as wrong or fighting for the Roman Empire. So all of these things were seen as actively hurting the economy, being actively against the Rome and the emperor. Um, and so they were seen as, as sub potentially subversive to the Roman emperor. Diocletian's going to go farther and say, not potentially, no, they're actively subversive and trying to destroy Rome, which is why he does an empire-wide attack. Um, let's look at the rest of these sources. Um, oh, I, I'm going to show you the pictures first. I said I was going to show you those. That's actually here. Um, early uh, images, just a few. The um, art of the Middle Ages lecture that's already up, that goes into some of those more, okay? So make sure you check out that. I just wanted to show a few here, but the whole other lecture on art through the Middle Ages and Byzantine period looks at early Christianity, um, uh, Jewish uh, art within the Roman world, uh, early Christian art um, that's still Romanesque, and then the shift and transition to Byzantine um, Christian art in the Middle Ages. Um, when you have uh, Christianity become legal after Constantine. So you're getting a much more in-depth thing of art there, but I just want to point out a few. This one was not in it. This is um, Rome, Roman uh, graffiti, um, and it's the first example of the Roman mention of Christianity. So uh, graffiti was a huge thing um, in Rome. In fact, it would be interesting to just do... Um, like a paper on Roman graffiti, um, because they did a lot of political graffiti on walls where they, you know, vote for this person, this person stinks, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a lot of political graffiti, but there was also just uh, uh, juvenile graffiti. There was um, uh, poetry. There was a variety warnings to people, like warning labels, essentially. So this is our. This is the first. This is the very first mention of Christianity that we see by the Romans, um, and it was graffiti. And it says, uh, Alec Minos worships his god. So here's Alec Minos. What's interesting, right, is you can see the hat. This is um, connecting it to uh, the Jewish faith. Right? So that's what that's interesting in that is that he's connecting it to being Jewish. And then you've, you've got the crucifixion, right, crucified, right, which equals criminal. And they're pointing that. And then, of course, that uh, in Meniceus Felix Octavius, the, the head of a donkey. The, there's that rumor that somehow spread that, that their god was a, a donkey, an ass, uh, uh, crucified and stuff. So the, the first, the first uh, mention of it, right, is it's mocking Christianity. All right, now those uh, secret signs that Meniceus Felix Octavius was talking about, that's these. Um, and you have, you have a couple different things. Uh, the fish um, and, and fishermen was a big one, and that's in part because of things that Jesus mentioned, the fisher of men. Um, you have the wheel here which was connected to it, or wheel of spokes. This evolves into the Cairo. That was a bad rendition of it. Which is a shorthand for Christ. And this becomes a major symbol used uh, with Constantine and the Byzantine Empire. The um, cross does not come until later. So cross comes much later. You have, uh, you also have a dove um, that was used. The fish symbol, right? Was they, this is more elaborate fishes, but you also had the more basic fish. But you here and and the um, the fishing lure, right? That was often part of it as well. And and these would um, these were all put on. Um, the signs were used for the uh, door frame, the door of home churches, so that other Christians who knew 
these symbols um, would would know that that was a church. Headstones uh, for graves, grave markers. And occasionally in writing, right? Those are when it was used. Um, and these are some of the early symbols that were done. Um, again, they weren't hiding, hiding. It didn't, wouldn't take a lot to figure this out. But but um, the average Roman wouldn't, these, it could just be that he was this person, right? This was on a headstone, but they were just a fisherman. Um, and, and early Romans wouldn't have had any connection that that fisherman meant Christian or that this wheel meant that as well. The Cairo becomes more obvious. Um, and, and by the time it's fully adapted, it's under Constantine when Christianity is legal anyway. Um, so these are the very, very early signs. The Cairo and is first, and then the cross, right? Those, um, those come about um, as you're moving into uh, the Byzantine Empire, right? They come later. They're, they're more um, uh, into the later Byzantine period. I have uh, coins that I would normally show you right if we were in class where it actually the coins show this transition. So I have two Roman coins that actually show, so this is after Constantine, but that show the Cairo um, and actually one Roman coin that has uh, the, the wheel and then a later Byzantine Roman coin that's got the cross. But again, that, that one was used much later. So it's interesting because even in the Roman coins, then you can see the evolution of Christian Byzantine Roman period where they're transitioning these signs and things that they're using. Um, okay, and then I real quick, because I know that it's getting long for time, um, the apologies here. This is a, this is a um, let's, let's write that on here real quick. Okay, um, so we have subversive. Now, the apologies happen because what, what happens is, let's put this at uh, four. We'll do um, changing Christian structure. Okay, so one of the things that happens is that you have more uh, Roman citizens, wealthy, citizens become Christians. And as more wealthy Roman citizens become Christians, they want to defend Christianity to, uh, to Rome. They also, though, still identify as Roman, and being Roman was important to them, right? Early Christians were mostly not Roman citizens. Um, and that was an easier way, though, of also having these accusations and, and other components to it. Um, and so they, there was this a desire to identify as Roman, show that they were Roman, but also defend Christianity. And so what you get that develops with this are what were called apologies. And they're not apologizing. Apology means defense. And these come about because of them being Roman citizens and more wealthy. And the defenses, though, help us, it, it shows us um, what Christians were being accused of by Romans, by non-Christian Romans, right? Accused of by non-Christian Romans. Because they wouldn't be um, writing defenses against this if... Um, these things weren't being thrown at them. One of the things that comes in repeatedly over and over is the name, right? And the name means criminal and the unfair aspect of that. And that, 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 that they should not be judged um, by a name alone. They also try to show that they're not breaking any laws and that they're not bad people. There's also one that uh, uh, makes it clear that they don't kill babies. <laughs> right? Um, and and, uh, ooh, and that one was not, not only kill babies and no multiple wives. This one was definitely targeting the um, orgies 
and uh, cannibalism uh, rumors and stuff. So real quick, just that Justin, uh, the first uh, um, apology, right? By the mere statement of a name, nothing is decided either good or evil apart from the actions associated with that name. Indeed, as far as the name with which we are accused goes, we are the most gentle people. But we do not think it's just to us to be acquitted on an account of the name. If we are convicted as evildoers, so on the other hand, if we are found to have committed no wrong, either in the appellation of the name or in our citizenship, you must exceed, be exceedingly anxious against incurring righteous judgment by unjustly punishing those who are not convicted. For from a name, neither approval nor punishment can fairly come unless something excellent or evil in the action could be shown about it. So right, they're saying that, the, that with the name, there has to be an action associated with it. Otherwise, what's the point? It's stupid. Um, it, you can't determine it and stuff. Um, and he says, you don't punish the accused amongst yourself before they are convicted. But in our case, you take the name as proof against us. And this, although as far as the name goes, you ought rather to punish our accusers. For we are accused of being Christian and to hate what is favorable is unjust. Again, if one of our accused deny the name, saying that he is not Christian, you acquit him as having no proof that he is an evildoer. And so he's, he's just saying, like, that makes no sense. So essentially the name itself is the crime. And how is it fair that the name itself is the crime? And then Tertullian, the apology, we're again defense. If then it is decided that we are the most wicked of people, why do you treat us so differently from those who are on par with us? That is, from all other criminals. The same treatment ought to be meted out for the same crime. When others are charged with the same crimes as we, they use their own lips and the hired eloquence of others to prove their innocence. There is full liberty given to answer the charge and cross-question since it is unlawful for people to be condemned without defense or hearing. Right? That's the trial. And he's saying all other criminals get trials. Why do but Christians know? Right? Christians alone are permitted to say nothing that would clear their name, vindicate the truth, and aid the judge to come to fair decision. Only one thing is what they wait for. That is the only necessary thing to arouse public hatred, the confession of the name Christian, not an investigation of the charge, right? This, this is the key here with this, and that's what he's saying, that, that it's just the name Christian causes it. Yeah, suppose you're trying any other criminal, if he confesses to the crime of murder, sacrilege, incest, or treason, um, the, to particularize the indictments that hurled against us. So there, murder, sacrilege, incest, and treason. Treason, what Romans see the Christians as. Once again, it tells us more about what they were accusing them of. Right? You are not satisfied to pass sentence immediately. You weigh the circumstances, the deed, how much it was committed, witnesses, etc. In our case, nothing of the sort. No matter what false charges made against us, we must be made to confess. Right? For example, how many murdered babies one has devoured? How many deeds of incest one has committed under the cover of darkness? What cooks and what dogs one had? This is totally from the one we just read. Right? Menicius Felix. Octavius. That, that is exactly... Um, the source we read that mentioned those. Oh, what glory for the governor who should discover someone who has already consumed a hundred infants. And then the letter to Dionysus, uh, Dionysus, uh, Di Di Digenesis, I can say it. Um, this one is kind of saying, we're like you. This one was definitely trying to say, hey, we're people too. We're just like you. For Christians are not distinguished from the rest of humanity by country, language, or custom. They live in cities. Um, they marry like everyone else, then have children, but they do not expose their offspring. That was a dig at Romans, uh, Romans uh, and, and Greeks. Uh, if they didn't want the baby, they exposed them. They left them out in, in the wilderness to die. And so this is like a straight, like, you're claiming we're killing babies. We don't expose our kids. You actually do. They share their food, but not their wives, right? Um, they um, they love everyone, and by everyone they're persecuted. So this is the same right we're attacked, but it's it's this idea that look we're not we're not some foreign country or people. We live here. We're like you, and that was what they were trying to showcase. Um, that that with the with these defenses. Okay, so the this is how Christianity was seen. Um, uh, 
for, for this period. Now this changes with um, Diocletian. Now Diocletian, why it does, there's a couple different reasons and stuff like that. One of the reason that this changes with Diocletian is the fact that you do have um, uh, changes in um, the Roman Empire. Diocletian uh, came at, as emperor. He was essentially the last Beric emperor. And that was a super chaotic, crazy time. Um, the Beric emperors were uh, soldiers, often uh, generals. And uh, they, um, you, you had the average lifespan of the Beric emperors about two years. There was about 26 Beric emperors in 50 years. Only one died of natural causes. He was the last one. He was able to change the system and end that crazy cycle of murder. Because basically what it learned is, oh, as a, 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 a soldier, I can just murder the emperor and take over. Um, and so it was tumultuous times. He also then tried to leave out a succession by setting up, and, and we'll talk about more of this in the, in the transition to the Byzantine period, of, of uh, uh, the Augusti, which he was, and then create a Caesar who would be underneath him. So when that they stepped down or died, the Caesars would automatically go into that place. He also divided Rome into Eastern and Western Empire. So there was a lot of changes. And he saw the economic problems because there was a lot of economic problems in the city of Rome and we'll say the Western Empire, the Western area, right? He saw that part of this was that Christianity was the problem. It was uh, challenging uh, Roman tradition, culture, and economic stability. And part of the reason for this, why he came to this conclusion, is because uh, Christianity by this point um, was growing rapidly. And a lot of Romans, like the one, the apologies we just read, were doing that. So he issued an empire-wide uh, persecution and ordered. Um, so this, so unlike Nero, right? This was actually the first one of the execution of all Christians throughout the empire. Now, some areas were more gung-ho in enacting this than others because the provincial governors still played a part in it as well as the Eastern Empire, which he ruled, versus the Western Empire, which the other Augusti ruled. They didn't um, take it. He was much more um, efficient and active in hunting down Christians than the Western Empire and the Augusti for that was, even though it's still part of the, the laws. And then again, it broke down into individual provincial governors and how forceful they were with it. But it, this was the first time it was an empire-wide Christianity is illegal. What this creates is going to be um, a sense of martyrdom. And this is actually going to be important for um, the identity uh, um, with Christianity and we'll see with later with um, uh, relics and, and stuff that way. So martyrdom and we'll say ideology is created for Christianity during this period. Um, okay, so this, this whole martyrdom and ideology um, the, the belief was, right, so you had now all these people that were being, um, and, and the thing was, not just persecuted, right, they would be executed, but you had, um, it was public executions. And that usually involved some form of torture um, and pain, right? It was not pleasant. And so the belief was, is that those who were martyrs were seen as extremely pious and um, because they were willing to die for their faith 
And this meant that there was, that what, what developed with this is that there became a connection that they would have special um, intermediary um, powers in heaven because of piety. Right, because they were so pious, because they were willing to face down death and pain for their faith, they uh, would be able to intercede on someone's behalf to talk to God. Um, and so first it started with uh, people asking them before they died, like visiting them in jail, um, to pray for them. or remember them once in heaven, right? This is going to evolve to um, the belief that um, bones, clothing, hair, anything of the person whether it was, uh, you know, jewelry, clothing, bones, anything a person, all, all of this had special connection to, to the person and to God then, right? This is where relics come from. This is where then you see the cath. This is going to be part of the Catholic Church later in the Middle Ages and pilgrimages, and Catholic churches still to this day um, have relics. And there, and um, people made pilgrimages to these uh, relics in the Middle Ages, especially. So you have some of you can see some of the early church development that ends up coming from this came from this. Now, the thing that's crazy is that, um, we'll put it as D here. Um, they, the church leaders, again, the churches are not out in the open yet either, but there were still more people that were Christians now, and you did have church leaders that were known, had to tell people that, um, Turning yourself in did not equal uh, martyrdom. So because there became such this massive emphasis on martyrdom, um, there were Christians who just went and were like, you know how I mentioned those flashing neon signs? I'm here, I'm Christian, arrest me. Well, they started doing that. They basically turned themselves in. Oh, you caught me because this the 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 whole thing around martyrdom became such this massive thing of it was a guaranteed ticket to heaven you were seen as such a religious pious person um and so people like turn themselves in and so then the church leaders had to be like hey, hey, hey uh you don't that's suicide not martyrdom and stop it <laughs> but but it, and then relics came from it so it, it became a really important thing now, uh, after Con uh, Diocletian uh, steps down and then others take over, you actually have um, a fighting for the empire. And we're going to get into this again in more detail um, when we talk about the Byzantine period. Um, but basically with this, um, you have Constantine uh, wins the fights for Rome, and he unifies uh, Rome back into one empire. He also makes Christianity legal. This is a huge thing because they've never been legal before. And we're gonna get in, again. We're gonna get into more detail next time because this is getting longer than I wanted it to be. Um, but one of the things is he's going to take funding to Christian churches, right? The Roman um, government would fund the, pa the pagan churches. Um, and now 
he gave funding to that. So this is going to allow for public churches and worship, which is eventually going to lead worship, which is eventually going to lead to the establishment of the Catholic Church, which was meant to be universal. That's what this is. Not, you know, that's not what eventually is going to come out of it, but that was the idea. You're also going to have um, th this is where you're also going to end up having um, the Christian art that's going to come out of this, as well as debates about doctrine and the creation of the Bible. Right, you had all the, these books of the Bible, but the canon of the Bible was not fully decided. All right, so what we're going to talk about the Byzantine world. We'll talk about Constantine in more detail about what he specifically did with all these things. This includes the Trinity um, and what that meant, the Bible, and Constantine as... So the, the Roman Emperor and the Byzantine... It's not technically the Byzantine world yet, but... Um, Constantine definitely was kind of that transition period. Justinian is usually seen as the first Byzantine Empire emperor, but Constantine was moving all of those things in that direction, the foundation periods. So he became Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex Maximus, remember, with Augustus, right? And what we talked about with that means head priest. Augustus was head priest of the, of the Roman church. Well, the idea was kind of merging um, Roman ideas and customs with Christian ones. So as head priest of the Christian church now. But in the past, right, it was head priest of the Roman pantheon of gods and temples. So it's just moving it to that. And that became the sense, though, of this became a characteristic of um, the Byzantine period. Right, that uh, the emperor played a key role in the church. Okay, um, so uh, that, that's, that's where we're going to leave it. Um, this also leads to, so larger consequences. Let's, let's leave it at that. We'll do, I'll do the larger consequences. And again, we're going to go over this in a little more detail later um, in the next lecture. But I want to get these key ideas down so you have them now anyway. And then we can just be in more detail. So the larger consequences of all of this in incorporation um, is that the uh, what was seen as the pagan uh, Roman religion declines significantly with lack of funding. You have a massive, uh, rapid shift from Roman polytheistic belief to Christianity, which again, massive growth in Christianity. So as soon as it's made legal, more and more people convert. Um, the, they're either Some it's for politics because Romans felt like that was the best way they could be part of the Roman government because Constantine was Christian. Others because of belief. The one thing that this does create though is a view that the church became too world, worldly. Right, that they were no longer like the original thing. Too large of churches. Some saw that as a good thing. Some saw it as not. That they were too focused on money and politics, and that was not the original intent, uh, intent of Christianity. It also created an orthodox structure. Right now that you have are allowed to have public churches, um, there has to be kind of here's our main doctrine. And they hadn't. There were all those extra church, uh, Christian literature. There were different branches, different ways that Christians practiced in their home churches. And so they had to create an orthodox structure with the Catholic Church, which is where you get, like I said, the concept of the Trinity, the concept of, um, of, of the canon of what's going to be in the Bible, what is orthodox, and what is heresy. Um, and then that, that was um, new 
um, ideas with that. B, C, D, and then um, the other thing was the creation of monks and monasteries. Monks and monasteries were a reaction to the worldly nature um, that they saw happening with the church. Worldly nature expansion of Christian churches. They um, believed that that focus was corruptive and they uh, rejected um, uh, expansion and wealth of new um, churches, let's say, and the public aspect of that. And so that whole development is going to come from that as well. Um, and then and then just the transition to Roman emperors as Christian emperors. Right, that's going to start with Constantine and then continue, specifically as one of the characteristics of the Byzantine world, or empire, we'll put empire. Okay, so uh, sorry that was a little bit longer than I wanted it to be. Um, we're going to pick up with the Byzantine world um, and transition to the Roman Empire and fall of the Western Roman Empire in the next lecture.